The history of military engineering is usually a story of slow, incremental evolution. Sword becomes spear, spear becomes arrow, musket becomes rifle. But occasionally, there is a black swan event, a moment where the paradigm shifts so violently that it renders entire armies obsolete overnight. For the German Wehrmacht, that moment arrived on October 6, 1941, near the Russian city of Metzensk. Until that morning, the German panzer divisions were the undisputed apex predators of the European battlefield. Their Panzer III and Panzer IV tanks, though not heavily armored, were mechanical watches of precision. They had radios, they had three-man turrets, and they had conquered Poland and France in weeks. The German generals, drunk on the success of the Blitzkrieg, believed that the Soviet Union would collapse just as easily. They believed the Russians were incapable of building advanced machinery. Then, General Heinz Guderian, the father of modern tank warfare, looked through his binoculars and saw something impossible. Emerging from the tree line were tanks he didn't recognize. They moved with a speed that defied physics for their size. When the German anti-tank guns opened fire, guns that had destroyed British Matildas and French Char B1s, the shells didn't penetrate. They simply bounced off. The Soviet tanks closed the distance and crushed the German positions under their wide tracks. This was the T-34. The T-34 shock sent a tremor of terror all the way back to Berlin. For the first time, German engineers were forced to admit that the subhuman Slavs, as Nazi ideology called them, had built a machine superior to anything in the German arsenal. The T-34 introduced a revolutionary concept, sloped armor. By angling the steel plates at 60 degrees, the effective thickness of the armor was doubled without adding weight. Hitler was furious. He demanded an immediate counterweapon. He didn't just want a tank that could kill a T-34, he wanted a tank that would assert total technological dominance. He ordered the creation of the Panzerkampfwagen Fei, the Panther. But great engineering cannot be rushed. And this is where the forensic trail of the Panther's failure begins, the timeline. Normally, designing a new main battle tank is a process that takes three to five years. Prototypes must be built, tested, broken, and redesigned. The supply chain must be established. The Panther was given a timeline of less than one year. Two industrial giants were pitted against each other, Daimler-Benz and Mann. Instead, he favored the Mayen proposal. The Mann design was distinctly German. It was tall, imposing, and complex. It kept the transmission in the front, a traditional German layout, the engine in the rear, and used a massive, high-velocity 75mm KWK-42 gun. The man design won the contract in May 1942, but as the engineers began to finalize the blueprints, the curse of mission creep set in. Originally, the Panther was specified as a 30-ton medium tank. It was meant to be agile, but Hitler looked at the armor thickness and said, Not enough. He ordered the frontal armor increased to 80 mm. Then he looked at the gun and demanded more ammunition storage. Then came the demands for underwater wading capability. With every meeting, the weight of the tank crept up. 30 tons became 35 tons. 35 tons became 40 tons. By the time the first production models rolled off the assembly line, the Panther weighed nearly 45 tons. It was no longer a medium tank. It was a heavy tank masquerading as a medium one. In engineering, weight is not just a number. Weight is force. Weight is stress. When you increase the mass of a vehicle by 50% without completely redesigning the drivetrain to handle that new mass, you are violating the laws of physics. The engineers at Mann knew this. They knew the engine, the Maybach HL210, later the HL230, was underpowered for a 45-ton beast. They knew the suspension arms were liable to snap. But the Ministry of Armaments forbade any major redesigns that would delay production. The order was, build it now, fix it later. So they built a 45-ton house on a foundation designed for a 30-ton cottage. And nowhere was this structural weakness more fatal than in the gearbox that drove the tracks. The final drive. To understand why the Panther spent more time on the back of a recovery truck than fighting, we have to open the hatch and crawl inside the mechanics of the machine. A tank is not a car. In a car, the engine turns the wheels directly. In a tank, the engine 
usually in the back, spins a drive shaft that runs the length of the hull to a transmission in the front. This transmission changes the gears, but the output of the transmission is spinning far too fast to turn the tracks. If you connected it directly, the tank would try to move at 200 miles per hour and have zero torque. It wouldn't budge. You need a reduction gear. You need to trade speed for power. This is the job of the final drive. Located on the outside of the hull, right behind the front drive sprockets, the final drive is the muscle of the tank. It takes the rotational energy and multiplies the torque to drag 45 tons of steel through waist-deep Russian mud. There are two main ways to build a final drive for a heavy tank. Method A, the planetary gear, epicyclic gearing. This is the gold standard. It uses a central sun gear surrounded by multiple planet gears, all enclosed in a ring gear. The load is distributed across multiple teeth simultaneously. It is incredibly strong, compact, and durable. The heavy Tiger I tank used this system. It rarely broke its final drives. The problem, planetary gears are complex. They require precision machining, high-quality ball bearings, and take a long time to manufacture. Method B, the double spur gear. This is the cheap and dirty method. It is simply a small gear turning a big gear. The power is transferred through a single point of contact, just one or two teeth meshing at a time. The benefit. It is easy to make. You can cut spur gears on simple milling machines. When the Panther's weight ballooned to 45 tons, the engineers at MEN begged to switch to a planetary gear system. They knew that a spur gear system could not handle the torque spikes of a 45-ton vehicle. The Ministry of Armaments said no. Why? Because Germany was running out of time. Man lacked the specialized gear-cutting machinery to mass-produce planetary gears. They had plenty of machines that could cut spur gears. So, the decision was made. The Panther would use the double spur gear system. This was the engineering equivalent of putting a bicycle chain on a bulldozer. The specific forensic flaw lies in the geometry of the gears. Because space inside the hull was tight, the spur gears had to be relatively small. To get the required reduction ratio, the teeth had to be under immense pressure. Every time a Panther driver famously popped the clutch or tried to turn the tank in thick mud, neutral steering, the entire 45-ton resistance of the vehicle was concentrated on the surface area of a single steel tooth in the final drive. Calculations done by post-war engineers suggest that under peak load, the stress on the Panther's gear teeth exceeded the yield strength of standard steel. But the design flaw didn't stop at the gears. It extended to the housing. The housing that held these gears was bolted to the side of the hull. Under the stress of movement, the hull of the tank actually flexed. The housing, however, was rigid cast steel. This mismatch caused the housing to deform slightly, forcing the gears out of alignment. Instead of meshing perfectly flat, the gears would start to mesh at an angle. This point loading concentrated the force even further, creating stress fractures at the root of the gear teeth. But a bad design can sometimes be saved by great materials. If the Germans had access to the best steel in the world, the Panther might have survived its own blueprint. Tragically for the Wehrmacht, by 1943, their steel was no longer the best. This brings us to the metallurgical crime scene. Steel is not just iron and carbon. To make armor plate or high-stress gears, you need spice. You need alloying elements that change the crystal structure of the metal. The most critical element for gear manufacturing is molybdenum. Molybdenum is a miracle metal. When added to steel, it increases hardenability and toughness. Hardness means the metal resists wear. Toughness means the metal resists snapping under shock. Usually there is a trade-off. If you make steel very hard, it becomes brittle, like glass. If you make it very tough, it becomes soft, like copper. Molybdenum allows you to have both, a hard gear that can take a hammer blow without shattering. Germany had no domestic source of molybdenum. Their entire supply chain relied on a single mine, the Knaben mine in occupied Norway. The Allies knew this. In 1943, realizing the strategic importance of this single element, the U.S. 8th Air Force and the RAF launched targeted bombing raids against Knaben. They didn't just bomb it once, they pounded it into dust. They also intercepted the shipments of ore coming from Japan, a blockade runner trade. By late 1943, just as Panther production was ramping up, 
Germany's supply of molybdenum dried up. The metallurgists at Krupp and Dortmund Herder were desperate. They had to make gears for the panther, but they couldn't use the recipe they trusted. They tried to substitute vanadium and manganese, but vanadium steel behaves differently. It is notoriously difficult to heat treat. To compensate for the lack of toughness, the factories decided to face harden the gears. They used a process to make the outside of the gear teeth incredibly hard to prevent them from wearing down. But because they couldn't control the cooling process perfectly, due to the lack of alloys and the rush of production. They inadvertently created a condition known as temper brittleness. The core of the gear was soft, but the outer layer was brittle, ceramic-like steel. Now, imagine the scenario. It is November 1943. The Eastern Front. A panther tank is sitting in frozen mud. The driver receives the order to advance. He revs the Maybach engine to 2,500 RPM and dumps the clutch. The torque travels down the drive shaft. It hits the final drive. The spur gear teeth slam against each other. Ideally, the molybdenum steel would flex microscopically to absorb the shock. But this is vanadium substitute steel. It doesn't flex. Snap. A tooth shears off. It falls into the bottom of the oil-filled housing. As the gear keeps turning, that broken metal tooth gets picked up and crunched between the next set of teeth. It creates a domino effect. Within seconds, the entire gear set shreds itself into metal confetti. The tank hasn't been hit by a shell. The crew is uninjured, but the tank is dead. And you cannot fix a final drive in the field. It requires a heavy crane to lift the armor plate. It requires a workshop. The crew has no choice. They rig demolition charges to the engine block, blow up their own 45-ton masterpiece, and walk home. The failure of the Panther's final drive was not a secret. It was a crisis. General Guderian reported that 60% to 70% of Panther losses were mechanical, not combat-related. The Germans tried to mitigate this not by fixing the engineering, which was impossible without stopping production, but by changing the psychology of the driver. They issued the famous Panther Fibel, Panther Primer. This was a comic book-style manual filled with cartoons and rhyming slang designed to teach young, uneducated crewmen how to treat their fragile machine. The manual explicitly warned drivers, do not turn sharply, do not accelerate fast, treat the final drive like a raw egg. Imagine the irony. Nazi propaganda touted the Panther as the invincible iron fist. But the secret manual told the crew, baby this tank or it will break. A weapon that you are afraid to use aggressively is not a weapon. It is a liability. At the Battle of Kursk, the debut of the Panther, the results were humiliating. Of the first 200 Panthers sent to the battle, two burned down coming off the train because the engines overheated. Before the battle even started, 15 more broke down with transmission failures during the approach march. By the end of the first week, barely 40 were operational. The T-34s, with their loose tolerances, sloppy welds and rattling transmissions, kept moving. They swarmed the immobile German giants and destroyed them. The Panther tank serves as the ultimate case study in the over-engineering trap. In the sterile environment of a design bureau or a museum floor, the Panther is perfection. It has the best gun, the best suspension, the best armor. But war is not fought in a museum. War is fought in mud, without spare parts, using substitute materials. The German engineers failed to ask the most important question, not what is the best performance we can achieve, but what is the best tank we can build with the materials we actually have. They designed a diamond, but they built it out of glass. The legacy of the Panther is a reminder that in engineering, robustness is a combat stat. A 45-ton tank that cannot move is nothing more than a very expensive pillbox. The T-34 was good enough to win. The Panther was too good to survive.